Today I'm just going to give a, a quick 10 minute, maybe even less, overview of um, what uh, this session will be about, how we can optimize translational studies in order to achieve a cure for this disease. Then I'll stop, take any questions, and then I'm going to talk about um, our newest finding of Sybil mutations in patients with de novo JMML. So I don't know if I have to say any disclosures, but I said no disclosures. I might in, uh, discuss a new investig investigational agent at the end of um, uh, this particular session. So basically, when I think about JMML as a clinician, as a pediatric oncologist, I think that there are three clinical challenges. Um, the first is that it's a very difficult disease to diagnose. The second is that it's a difficult disease to follow patients on therapy. And finally, it's a very difficult disease to treat and to cure. And I think, as I think about translational studies, preclinical models, basic science, clinical trials, I think that all of them, as Ben has alluded to, really revolve around these three principles for patients. So what strategies can we use to improve outcomes for JMML? The first one that one could take would be a genetics approach. That is, can you identify novel genetic mutations in this disease and further understand how these genetic mutations affect biochemical signaling? And today, I'll talk a little bit about our work, and Dr. Hayashi will talk a little bit about a novel translocation um, uh, discovered in JMML. You can actually then take those genetic mutations and you can incorporate those into revised diagnostic criteria, which until now remain um, sort of still a bit of a Chinese menu, you know, three from column A, two from column B. Um, you can also correlate genotype and phenotype, and we'll hear from Dr. Muromatsu and Kave on uh, looking at how specific um, genes that are mutated in the RAS pathway may correlate with patients and outcome. Um, and, and potentially then um, start to stratify patients with this rare disease into groups that might be better treated with different therapies. Um, and uh, we have done in the past, um, we have designed assays to actually measure disease burden, for instance, to follow patients on therapy, which we will not discuss today, but which um, we have previously published in blood um, uh, with Sophie Archambault being the leading author. We can also take a functional approach, and that is, how do these genetic alterations um, affect gene expression and cell signaling? Unfortunately, we just got word that Marco Zecca is not going to be here to, uh, to discuss his um, elegant gene expression studies, and I don't know if anybody here is planning to do that in his stead. We didn't get a substitute in for him, okay. Um, and Dr. Emanuel and Lucy Liu uh, will also uh, talk about some of their work um, with P10 and JMML. Um, Dr. Gaipa will further the discussion um, of the JMML signaling signature um, that he and we and others have uh, uh, interrogated using phosphoflow cytometry, both as a potential diagnostic tool and a minimal res residual disease tool, and I would also present as a potential way to um, uh, measure um, sort of the effect of targeted inhibitors when we take those into clinical trial. And then finally, Dr. Q will, uh, Chu will um, uh, discuss how we might use pathway-specific inhibitors, particularly um, raised against the SHIP2 phosphatase, to abrogate some of these signaling signatures. And the ultimate goal, of course, for all of us is to take new agents into clinical trial, and we'll hear later on about some of the um, preclinical models that are uh, currently under development and some of the headway that's been made in those models. So just by way of review, all of you know that JMML is a clonal myeloproliferative disorder of young children. This is a representative slide from a patient that we followed at UCSF. Um, for some reason, uh, which I don't think we really understand, boys are more frequently affected by, than girls. Um, this is a review by Charlotte Niemeyer in Blood in 1997. And what you can also see is that it is a disease that occurs in very young, oops, now this isn't working. Well, okay. <laughs> it was just working. Well, very young children over there. <laughs> Less than one. <laughs> um, survival following conventional chemotherapy is quite dismal. Um, this, again, was a review. Thank you. Okay. Um, this was a, a review um, by Charlotte, again, from that same blood paper. Uh, these are just patients stratified by the presenting platelet count at the time of diagnosis who were treated without a stem cell transplantation. Clearly, those patients who uh, present with a lower platelet count have uh, poor outcomes, but all of these uh, event-free survival curves go down to less than 10 percent. 
So clearly, we need to improve outcomes from that standpoint. And then uh, Franco Locatelli, on behalf of the EWOG MDS-97 trial, reported uh, in 2005 that, in fact, hematopoietic stem cell transplant is curative with a sort of overall survival of approximately 64 percent and an event-free survival um, at, of uh, 52 percent. Um, we do know, uh, and again, this is very relevant as we dissect out the molecular genetics of this disease, that neonates with Noonan syndrome generally have a self-limited MPD, a myeloproliferative disorder. This disorder generally uh, goes away within the first year of life. Um, and then the other really interesting thing that has been circulating in the literature that I don't think we know how to solve yet or how to explain is that there are case reports of patients who spontaneously resolve their disease. And this appears to be present in patients with RAS mutations um, as well as potentially patients with Sybil mutations, and I'll discuss that today. And again, the mechanism for this really isn't well known, but it's certainly a very interesting question and a relevant question for our patients and families as they face these decisions about um, uh, the burden of therapy that we currently recommend, which is stem cell transplant. One hallmark feature of JMML and even Noonan syndrome MPD is hypersensitivity of myeloid progenitor cells to GMCSF and culture. These are just um, GMCSF hypersensitivity assays. This is percent maximal colony growth on the y-axis and increasing doses of GMCSF. These are a number of JMML samples and a number of normals. And you can see that in the absence of GMCSF or at low doses, there are spontaneous colonies that form. And you've already heard a lot about that this morning from some of the other talks. Um, the, we do know, though, that colony assays are somewhat nonspecific, since there are some infectious diseases that affect young children that are known to confer hypersensitivity. This is just what some of the colony assays look like. This is a JMML bone marrow and increasing doses of GMCSF and a healthy bone marrow. And so last year, uh, and again, Dr. Gaipa will discuss um, the work that has emerged from Italy. Last year, we published how we can use phosphoflow cytometry to identify a small subset of cells that hyperphosphorylate STAT5 in the presence of increasing doses of GMCSF. Um, and this uh, is further subsetted out into to cells that express CD33-14. Um, uh, and so um, Dr. Gaipa will discuss some of their findings a little bit later.